as adults could be that enthusiastic. Why can't we? Creighton! Yeah. Hey, all right. <laughs> okay. My name's Creighton Beatty, and I'm a Krispy Kreme donut-aholic. <laughs> you know, for those that really do struggle with alcohol, please accept our teasing about being something-aholic. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'm a sin-aholic. And I gave my life to Jesus in uh, April of 1970. And uh, I, love, I love living for Jesus. And, uh, and I've done a whole lot of sinning, and that's not a brag, that's a shame. And uh, I know that you've done a lot of sinning as well. How do I know that? Because we're human. Exactly right. And uh, that doesn't give us an excuse to continue in sin. After all, Jesus has done for us. It's just the fact that, that we do. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, I'll look at that in a moment. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm, I'm talking about uh, this short series here for the, the new year 2020. Uh, in this new year, the series is Serving Jesus with 2020 Vision. And uh, this is the second message in this. And so I'm talking about holiness without which no one will see the Lord. A man walked into the doctor's office and uh, he said, I've got these sharp shooting pains, this headache I just can't get rid of. And the man said, well, do you drink alcohol? And he said, no, I don't, I don't drink. He said, oh, do you smoke cigarettes? He said, no, I, don't, I never touch the filthy things. He said, well, I'm embarrassed to ask you this, but do you run around at night? He said, no, what do you take me for? And the doctor said, so it's, again, it's a sharp shooting pain about right here? He says, yeah. He said, I know what your problem is. You've got your halo on too tight. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there is something in the Bible that if we don't have it, the Bible says we're never going to see the Lord. And that is the most difficult message for me to preach, I think, this year. Is to be able to speak on the holiness of God. Uh, any, any person to speak about the holiness of God, and we're unholy. But we try to be holy, don't we? God is so great. God is so good. God is so powerful. He's so awesome. He's so rich. And we're sinners. And now you're going to call upon me to talk about the holiness of God and how difficult this message would be. If you've turned to Hebrews chapter 12, let me have you read verse 14. Now this translation that I hold today is the New American Standard Bible and therefore it's not going to use the word holy. It's going to use the word sanctification. Let me read. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. This is phenomenal. What is it talking about? It's talking about holiness. And that sanctification means set apart. It, it is set apart, that we set our lives apart for Jesus. You have to do that. You have to set your life apart for, uh, for Him. And it assumes that when we do this, that we're going to live holy. Now, we set things apart all the time. You might have an envelope back at the house, or you might have a bank account set apart that you might have a special section in your wallet where you can't see it too often, but you've got some hidden money, men, in that wallet. You've got a little, that's do-as-you-please money, that special occasion that pops up, and you're ready. You, you might have something set apart. It might be for a rainy day. It might be for retirement. It might be a college fund. It may be vacation money, but you know what I'm talking about. We set things apart all the time. We, we have a special place that we hide birthday presents from people. We hide Christmas presents from people. Might be a place in the garage, might be the trunk of the car, under a bed. Oh, have I given you away already? But we do. We have, we have so many pictures on our smartphone. And you can't scroll through a thousand. I'm not going to tell you how many I've got. 
But you've got a special folder that if you want to show them your pet or your grandchildren or something, an event at church, you've got a special folder. We set things apart all the time. And we are God's special people. And we are his favorite people. And he set us apart and he expects us to set ourselves apart. But guess what? We live in a sophisticated society, don't we? Many people are so sophisticated, they, they refuse to believe in God. I'll tell you how sophisticated we are. Watch the evening news about what goes on in Chicago on a daily basis. That's how sophisticated we are. We are sinners, and we are in trouble without Jesus Christ. We must have a holiness perspective. <clears throat> holiness. Look at, look, at social, look at social evils that we do. Um, we, how we treat foreigners and aliens. How we, how we take a, a, a growing, living human baby inside of a, a mother's womb and we, we murder that child, we destroy that child. Look, look at how our society is plagued with suicide and divorce and sexually transmitted disease. Have you sat and pondered how you get a sexually transmitted disease? And we are so sophisticated. Illegal drugs, domestic abuse, gossip, envy, stealing, dissension, backbiting, false witness, lying, lust, and on and on to go. We need the holiness perspective again in our culture. We need it in the church, and let's get it back. I want to go to an Old Testament text of Isaiah in chapter 6. You can turn there with me in your translation you carry in your phone. Isaiah 6. And I want to read 1 through 6, but really what I'm looking for is verse 3. And, and this was written uh, about 730, 740 before Christ was born on earth. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him. Seraphim, what's, what's that? Angelic being with six wings. He's going to talk about it and define it for, our, for us right here in, in verse 2. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he, they, the seraphim cover their face. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called him with the temple, with filling with smoke. And, and then I said, Woe is me, I, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it, said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. God is so holy that the seraphim whom God created, that that was their job. They were just to flutter, they were to fly, uh, they covered their face, they covered their feet, and they were to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They covered their feet because they're not a permitted, they're created to fly, they're seraphim, and they're not permitted to land in the presence of God. That's how holy God is. You remember Moses when he was before the burning bush and God told him to what? Why? You're on holy ground. What made the desert and that rock so holy? Yes. Yes. God was there. He is holy. 
He is holy. There is a process in our journey with Christ that will lead us to be more like him. Thank you, Joe, for saying that in your meditation for communion. It will cause us to live more holy. It will cause us to live more set apart. And this is not a works salvation. This is a process of sanctification. This is the process of understanding how holy God is. And he called us to be his people. And therefore we must live holy. What is holiness? Separated. It is the separation from sin so we can be consecrated to God. You know, we've repented We've repented enough to be forgiven, but have we surrendered enough to be changed? We must live as if we've been changed. For without which, we will never see the Lord. Sainthood is not an attainment. It is a state into which God calls us by His grace. If you're a Christian, you know, in, in the Bible, it calls you a saint. We don't like that word. I remember the first time because I wouldn't do something when I was 12 years old, and another 12-year-old said, what, are you a saint? And I didn't know what a saint was, so I went, no. <laughs> wow. Believers are called to sanctify, set themselves apart cleansing ourselves from all defilement, forsaking sin, living a holy manner of life, experiencing fellowship with God in His holiness. And therefore, He does call us a holy temple. He calls us a holy priesthood. He calls us a holy nation. We are separated for Him. Now, you set apart things all the time. I, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you might eat on paper plates back at the house? You've got other dishes, I guess. You, you've got the regular, what, what's that called, Corelware? You've got, the, if you're not on paper, you're on some cheap version of something. But some of you have china, and you're going to break out the china on something special. I have been blessed. Who knows how many grandchildren my grandmother, Sarah Beatty, had. I, I'd, I'd never counted but I've got my grandmother's china. She died at age 92 back in 98. And I got it. And don't you know, I pull that out, don't we, Deb? I pull that out on special occasions when back in North Carolina when I could get my brothers and sisters to come and nieces and nephews, and I'd give a little speech. This was grandmother's china. And we talk about our grandparents and our parents. It's special. And God talks about you. You're special. You're set apart. We are a holy people. And this is what God wants from us to be sold out to him. Uh, Dr. Cottrell, retired from Cincinnati Bible Seminary. He wrote this in his book, For the Faith Once for All, about God. We know that God is a spirit, self-existent, infinite, eternal, righteous, immutable. And that means he's changeless. He's, a, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the scripture says. He's transcendent. He, he can go from his world to our world. He can go from heaven to hell if he wants to. He transcends anything. He's sovereign. He's omnipotent. And that he means he's all-powerful. He's wise. God is good. He's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. <clears throat> he's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. He's imminent in the created world. He's glorious. He's loving. And yet we find out that this God is jealous. And you're thinking, as I said last week, how can, how can omnipotent, all-powerful God be jealous of us? <clears throat> he's jealous because... We're set apart for him. And when we go out to live in the world because I own my own body, I am this and I am that, and I'll live like I want to, and don't you tell me what I'm going to do. God's jealous that the devil has us. God wants us back. And he's jealous for that. 
And whereas we might stumble to say, how in the world is a, is a powerful God jealous? It's just a human way to express what we understand. We understand jealousy. And, it, and all it's saying is God wants us back. <clears throat> God wants us back. He is holy. He's the most beautiful, goodness, gracious, patient, merciful, righteous, but he is not defiled and we are. You've heard the term <clears throat> dross, <clears throat> melting gold, and you know that this, the material, the, the dross surfaces to the top. Uh, <clears throat> if you've got anything, a samurai sword, if you've got anything that is precious metal, then it's gone through a process to be that way. Uh, they melt it, they beat on it, they cool it. They heat it back up, they beat on it, and they cool it. And they do this process over and over so it'll be tough, so it'll endure, so it'll last. And gold is, is pure gold when it's gone through this process, and dross is the waste matter the refuse, the scum of metals, it's the dregs, it's the slag when it goes through this process. And, and sometimes you can't understand why you're going through such a hard time. It might be because uh, <clears throat> the devil wants you and he's beating you up. So you'll curse God. It could be that the Lord God is putting you through a test. So he's putting you through that melting process and he's going to beat on you a while and shape you and cool you down. And we learn lessons, don't we? When God does that to us, don't run from him. Don't run from him. He's trying to make us into the image of his son. <clears throat> and God said of his people Israel in Ezekiel 22:18, Israel has become the dross of silver. Why? Because they had neglected and left God and they, they became... We've all always been sinners, but uh, they began to sin against God with foreign and false gods. He wanted them to be holy. He commanded them to be holy, and they became scum of metal, spiritually speaking. So, number two, who is holy? <clears throat> and we know that God is holy. The core of God is holiness. <clears throat> you see that big word up there? That's a $64 word. Ontologically. Ontologically. God is ontologically holy. That means he's holy to the core. I've talked about it before. Uh, I'm gold-plated. You're gold-plated. You scratch on us, and you're going to find out how unholy we are. But you scratch on God, and he's gold. He's holy all the way through. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I need to go back because I've asked some people to participate with me. We don't have seraphim today. They're in heaven. But I'm going to ask certain selected ones to participate with me as we talk about God. I want to read that verse again in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Church, praise his name. He alone is holy and righteous, and we are not. Please be seated. But he, he, allows us to be holy. He passes holiness on to us. He pronounces us holy. We are ethically holy. And that's the second part of that. We are ethically holy. We're not ontologically holy. It, it means that we try to separate ourselves by practicing holiness. 
everything morally wrong. We're to get rid of it out of our life. We're not fooling him. We're only hurting ourselves when we won't repent and purge things out of our life. <clears throat> we try to live according to his commands and, <clears throat> and we try to be as he is. We want to be like him. And yes, we do strive at this. Why do we strive at this? Why is it so hard? Because we're human. We have the propensity to sin. It's in our makeup. And we struggle. And we do strive. Why is it so hard to be holy? Because you're just like the rest of us. It's hard on all of us. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And when we try to be holy, we are trying to imitate him and be like his son. And that flatters God. And he loves it when we try to be like his son. God is honored by our loving what he is so much that we would practice it in our lives. And it shows up in us trying to be a good neighbor. It shows up in us trying to be a good spouse. It, it shows up by we trying to be responsible, good citizens. That we try to be soul winners like Jesus. That we try to be honorable men and women. Uh, do it to please God and to bring Him glory. Now, there's a lot of scriptures. We're not going to look up each one of these scriptures. Leviticus 20, verse 26. <clears throat> but it says, you are to be holy. You're to be holy to me. 1 Peter 1, holy in all your behavior. Psalm 25, 8 says that God is uh, good and upright. 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself as he is pure. Well, that's our goal. Have we accomplished it? The, 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 the man or the woman that you respect the most in this room, you admire their Christianity. You admire how they've done. What they've done is they matured in Christ. They're not perfect. They matured in Christ. And that's why you respect them. And that's why you love what Jesus has done in their life. But perfect? None of us are perfect. What God said he was against, we've committed. We've missed the mark, and that's on the screen. And what is the bullseye? The bullseye is holiness. <clears throat> and I blew it yesterday, but I got up this morning. And sometime through the day, I'm going to blow it again. Hopefully you won't see it. And I can still have a good impression. <clears throat> but God knows. But I, I, I really do believe in this. And I really do want to do it. Don't ask my wife. And don't ask my kids. And don't ask our cat. <laughs> because I really do believe in this. And I really do want to live this way because God called me to it. Not as a preacher, as a Christian. He called you to it as well. We've missed the mark. So, can I be holy? On vacation one year, <clears throat> I was down south, and I went to Wednesday night Bible study at this church, and uh, the, the, the topic was holiness. And the preacher tried his best to explain we were to be holy, and everybody seated there said, we can't be holy. And they were saying, why try? And so I tried to join in the conversation. That's what everybody wants, right? Another preacher to join in. And we could not get that class to see that they're to strive to be holy. And I said the word strive. But we are. Ethically. We are to live holy. He's ontologically holy. He doesn't have to try. That's his nature. And the seraphim said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So can I be holy? <clears throat> Without which no one will see the Lord. We must understand that God has a zeal for moral uprightness. He delights in us acting holy. Not pretending but that practicing is a better word. Practicing to be holy. God cares about it so much that he promises that he will prune on us. I want to go to John's Gospel, chapter 15. 
in verses 1 and 2. Ah, the whole, the whole 12, 13, 14 verses is, is good on it. But I want to I pick up verses 1 and 2 of John 15. About uh, God owns the vineyard, but Jesus is the vine dresser. And we, we Christians are branches. And it says here in chapter 15, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit. And so God's going to cut on us here and there. Why? He wants us to look like Jesus. And I hope that you feel in 2020, the year 2020, I hope you feel God cutting on you. That there's things that we need to rid out of our lives because it's holding us back. <clears throat> he cuts away the unnecessary. He cuts away the dead. He, cu he cuts away the unfruitful. In uh, <clears throat> our text, uh, I'm going to read quick uh, Hebrews 12, 10 through 17. They disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, that's a good word, oh, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Twelve, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And that's what some people are. They, they love Jesus. They want to live for Jesus, but they're weak. They're feeble in this spiritual journey. Therefore, strengthen, verse 12, the hands that are weak, verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. 14, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and <clears throat> by it many be defiled. <clears throat> Verse uh, 16. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Live holy. Live holy. Second Peter, chapter 1, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And when we live this way, he, through our faith, Listen to it, church. Listen to this. If you, if you fell asleep, nudge him. He gives us this imputed righteousness. He gives us this grace. He gives us this holiness, and it's so important. You're struggling. I know you're struggling. I struggle. But he gives us a place in the kingdom. We didn't earn that place. You didn't work for that place. He did it out of his love and his mercy and his grace. So praise his name. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. <clears throat> we didn't work for it. He gave it. Now, how? Through Jesus. I'm going to turn quickly over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it reads this way. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify. There's that sanctification. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, the church, you, me, would be holy and blameless. Wow. Wow. Verse 32. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And then in chapter 1, verse 4 of this same letter, 1, 4. 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. That's what he expects. Well, I'm not doing too good. I don't feel too good about it. I don't think I can do it. You cannot do it on your own strength. I promise you. I promise you you can't. I've tried. It comes through Jesus. Not that we'll ever be perfect here, but we will be there, and he gives us that as well. Love your families. Love Christ. Love the church. In fact, Paul commands us to have holy hands. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 8, it says, Therefore, I want uh, the men in every place to pray, lifting holy hands without wrath and dissension. In context, the emphasis of raising our hands in worship uh, to God is to present a certain kind of hand to Him. Did you pick it up in the text already? Lifting what kind of hands? Oh, you doggone right. And we leave our palms open to the Lord. That is, we bring no worldliness into this building to worship our God. Our palms are empty. We don't bring the things in here from the world. This is a sacred place. This is a holy place. And, and therefore, nothing vile or ugly or sinful in our life. Our, our hands are holy unto the Lord. And Jesus, I'm an open book. I give you my life. I don't know if you've ever been uh, running from the police. Don't raise your hand. But when they trap you on a big tall fence or the end of a building or an alley, what do they want you to do? Now, why would they want you to do that? It says you want to make sure you don't have something that's going to harm them in your hand. And, and we, we bring our hands before the Lord and we raise holy hands. I bring nothing. I am not a threat to you. Not that I ever could be. Not that I ever could be. But I bring a certain kind of hand. I bring holy hands because I'm doing ethically the best I can and I believe in this. And It's the idea of a handshake. When you shake a person's hand and your hands are open, I bring no weapon. I am not out to hurt you. Another reason that we leave our palms open before him is so that he may feel them. A child comes running to mom or dad. Boy, one of my joys is to go see my grandkids and what do they do? And what do they want? They want me to reach down and their arms go around my neck and I hold them, right? You doggone right. What do you think God wants? You raise your hands up and you're saying, hold me. Pick me up. I've got nothing on my own. And I need you. Raising hands says all kinds of things. This is the attitude in worship as we focus on Him in our prayers and when we lift up holy hands. You feel close to God and you reach up for Him. I'm reaching to you, Lord. I feel near you, Lord. It, it, it is a very spiritual moment. And you feel like the woman who reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Uh, she was unclean. And <clears throat> she reached out to him. Uh, there's a concept in the Old Testament. I'm not going to go into detail because it's too bizarre for us to understand. But it's the wave offering in Leviticus chapter 23. It's where you take the sheaves and you wave them. And, and, and what is a, a, a sheaf? It's a, a bundle of grain stalks. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord uh, for you to be accepted. That's a bizarre concept. I don't need to keep talking about it because I'll get deeper and deeper in trouble with you. You don't understand it. But it is to weigh that. And what do you think they did to Jesus at the triumphal entry when they took the palm branches and they what? They waved them. They waved them. And uh, we need to quit saying that this was for the Jews. This was written by the Apostle Paul to the evangelist Timothy in the church. I want the men in every place to lift up holy hands. King David worshipped this way. King Solomon prayed for the dedication of the temple. In 1 Kings, in chapter 8, it says that he knelt down. We could kneel down in here. I think I will. 
we could kneel down and raise our hands to the Lord. And why do I care what you think? I'm not worshiping you. I'm worshiping the Lord God as I'm trying ethically to be the most holy person I can be. And I cry out to God. And it shows dependence. It shows surrender. It shows submission. It shows humility. And I, I personally am not against raising hands in worship. But my point today is holiness. Whether you raise hands or you don't raise hands, that does not matter to me. It matters to me as the preacher of this church uh, that you are holy. And that if you raise hands, you're doing your best to raise holy hands before the Lord God. Raising hands is optional. Holiness is mandatory. Titus chapter 2. Am I getting near the end? I think I am. In Titus, chapter 2, 1 through 5. Chapter 2, 1 through 5. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, in love, in perseverance. Uh, older, uh, older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior. Not malicious gossips or in, enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind of being subject to their own husbands, so that, and here, here it is, here's why I'm reading it. Here it is, so that the word of God will not be maligned, is one translation, another translation, is that the Word of God will not be dishonored. Because when we do not live holy, we dishonor the Word of God. Well, I'll, I'll do what I want, and you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm just getting you ready for the judgment day, people. He's going to tell you what it's all about at the end. And he desires holiness out of Creighton Beatty, and I find it very hard to be like Jesus sometimes. Oh, oh, I agree with being like Jesus. I just stick my foot in my mouth. You might have that disease. No. My goodness, people. We blaspheme the Word of God. We live holy so people will not trash the Word of God. Uh, he, he said to repent of carnality. He, he said us, told us to shun hedonism. And that's uh, dedicating everything to the flesh. He told us to embrace Jesus. And we all have been chasing after worldliness, uh, a life of self and selfishness uh, that we can't hear God calling us to a holy life. And, and when we hear the call, we're not interested. That's something I'll do one day. I'm, I'm going to live like that too. But right now, I've got a lot of stuff to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the devil whisper in my ear for a while. What are you reaching for? Isaiah 40, verse 26. God names the stars and calls them by name. Calls them all by name. Not a, not a one God doesn't know the name of a star. And our names are in the Lamb's book of life. And, and he calls each one of us by name. That's pretty special to be called by name, isn't it? I try to remember people's names. I, I get a glitch once in a while and... And I know you, I just can't say the name sometimes. You ever been that way? Thank you. You know, when I moved here a year ago, I gave everybody my cell phone number. You know, if you'd logged my number in your phone, then you would know it's me when I call. But a lot of you didn't. And when I text, you text back, who is this? And it lets me know. You didn't log my name in your phone. <laughs> now, you got my call. You didn't know who it was. 336 area code is a telemarketer. You wouldn't answer. God knows your name, every last one of us. And he loves us. And he'll call you by name. And when my name is called at the judgment day of God, and when your name is called at the judgment day of God, 
Let's be on speaking terms with the Lord. Let's be holy when we get there. Not, not, not that I got it right, but I was seeking maturity to look like his son. Made my mistakes, doggone right. Yeah, you did too. But God will give us that righteousness. He'll give us that holiness. And uh, I praise his name. I praise his name for that. Let, let me read one last verse to show you how serious this is. Isaiah 35, verse 8. A highway will be there, a roadway. It will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him that walks that way. Fools. Fools will not wander on it. I'm sure a message like this, we can't convince everybody, but we better be holy before the Lord. Fools will not wander on that road. But people that say, God, I'm going to ethically try my best to live, that people will not disparage the word of God, and that people will not have a, 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 a way to speak bad about the church because I'm going to do my best to live for Jesus. And I say, God bless you in that. God bless you in that, and God bless me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I celebrate Jesus. I celebrate grace. I celebrate uh, the Holy Spirit. I celebrate holiness. I'm so far from it. I'm scared somebody might bump my cup for fear of something ugly might spill out. But I love Jesus, and I do believe in holiness, and I do want to live that way. And I know these people here, they love you. They love Jesus. They, they believe in holiness. But we've all messed up. Lord God, I pray for the man or the woman, the boy or girl right now, who uh, believes in you, and they're here, but uh, they've, never, they've never been baptized into Christ. Uh, they maybe never taught about it, or, or maybe they've just, uh, they didn't want to go that far in this, in this church thing. Uh, Father, it might be they've repented in private prayer, but they've never confessed the name of the Lord publicly, and they need to do that today. Whatever their need is, dear God, you have provided a way that it can be filled. And so I pray for them, that they would come and give their life to Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.